It is my honor and pleasure to introduce Dr. Victor Ancomasek. He is the director of the Liver Transplant Program at Houston Methodist Hospital. He is board certified in internal medicine, gastroenterology, and transplant hepatology. He is an American Gastroenterology Associate Fellow and a member of several medical associations, including the American Association for the Study of Liver Diseases. He obtained his MD from the University of Ghana Medical School following his medical internship and residency at the Johns Hopkins Affiliate Program at the Good Samaritan Hospital in Baltimore, and he completed his gastroenterology and hepatology fellowship training at University of California, San Francisco. He was the chief of hepatology at St. Luke's Episcopal Hospital, Houston from 20, 2007 to 13, and also served as medical director of St. Luke's Episcopal Hospital Liver Health Outreach Program. He's also a clinical associate professor of medicine at the Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. He was on the faculty of UT Medical School from 96 to 2002, and from 99 to 2002 served as the chief of hepatology and medical director of liver transplantation at UT Medical School Memorial Hermann, where he held the position also of assistant professor of medicine. He is also the director of Liver Associates of Texas, which he founded in 2002. He has published more than 100 original papers, review articles, and abstracts, and is the ad hoc reviewer of several clinical and biomedical journals. He has an active practice of patients with liver and digestive diseases, and his clinical interests revolve around the optimal management of patients with chronic viral hepatitis B and C, fatty liver, liver tumors, cirrhosis, advanced liver disease, liver transplantation, PBC, and maintaining liver health. He's actively engaged and directs the clinical research program at the Liver Associates of Texas, and it is my pleasure to welcome and introduce to you the man that keeps me sane and talks me down when my numbers are up, Dr. Victor Ancomasek. Thanks, Tina. That's a rousing introduction. I wonder who she was talking about. Uh, I want to thank uh, the B PBCers for organizing this conference. It's quite impressive. They have very good turnout. Um, and I also want to thank them, especially Tina, for giving the opportunity to talk to you today about a subject that's very dear to my heart, uh, liver transplantation and uh, PBC. So we'll start off by giving you, sorry, where's the advance, sorry. <laughs> Move away from the podium. Okay, here we go. So I think PBTS also uh, have, I'd have to thank you quite a bit in terms of making the move towards the medical community, moving from primary biliary cirrhosis to the new name, uh, primary biliary cholangitis. So I think thanks to your uh, hard work, uh, ground work, it really is now generally accepted in a lot of the medical journals that PBC should be primary biliary cholangitis rather than cirrhosis. Um, and you could see that from uh, 2015, since the position paper was published, a lot of the uh, journals in the medical literature, especially gastroenterology and hepatology, are now moved towards uh, cholangitis as the proper name for PBC patients. So again, I think this is speaking to the uh, choir. They already know what's going on with that. So my talk to the, to this evening is going to be centered on PBC. We'll talk about the hallmarks, natural history, clinical features, and therapy as it relates to transplantation. I can see from your brochure that actually you're going to have a talk tomorrow as to the clinical features and diagnosis of um, PBC. So there'll be a little bit of overlap, but it's always good to emphasize some of these uh, 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 diagnostic tests and uh, management spells that you need in PBC patients. So in terms of epidemiology, uh, it's a quite a prevalent uh, disease, about uh, 19 to 400 cases per million. 9% are women, it's a women's disease. I have a few men in clinic who have PBC and I have to really console them that it's okay to have PBC despite being male. Uh, we have about one case by 1,000 women. It's a disease of middle-aged women, 40 to 70. And the important note in terms of transplantation when it comes to epidemiology that I want you to pay attention to is that PBC is actually the second cause, 
leading cause for liver transplantation uh, since 1988 behind hepatitis C. So that tells you that in women, uh, PBC is a big deal in terms of transplantation. Um, in terms of um, pathogenesis, in terms of how do you get PBC, I'm sure you guys have heard about this quite often. Uh, it's a combination of environmental, genetic, immunological factors that damage the bowel ducts uh, within the liver, we call the intrahepatic ductules, leading to scarring, and uh, if it is extensive, you, you then go on to cirrhosis. So uh, scarring, most patients ask me what's fibrosis, just mainly scarring of the liver. When you cut yourself, you heal by laying down scar tissue, and that's what uh, uh, fibrosis is. If it's very extensive, then it uh, really can go on to uh, cirrhosis. Um, cholangitis, which is the inflammation of the bowel ducts, causes the scarring, and uh, it prevents the liver from working well, uh, causing liver failure, and puts you at risk of liver cancer once you get to cirrhosis. So there's a healthy liver, and there's a liver with cirrhosis. So in a patient with uh, chronic liver disease, such as PBC, uh, you could evolve, you could stay in this position for a while, or you could uh, evolve into what we call compensated cirrhosis, meaning that the patient has very stable cirrhosis, doing very well, or they could have a complication, either bleeding internally, I'll talk to you some more about that, developing fluid in the abdomen called ascites, getting confused, we call encephalopathy, having jaundice, and in, when that happens, we tell you that you now have decompensated cirrhosis or liver failure, and if you don't get a transplant in a timely fashion, there's a risk of, of dying. So that's something that happens. So the natural history of PBC, you could think of it in terms of variants, that there are subgroups of PBC patients who do very well. They might never need a transplant. Some subgroups also get very aggressive disease and do poorly. So the first two subgroups are the subclinical, who might just have a positive AMA, which is a test you'll hear about tomorrow, and normal alkaline phosphatase, they might have a positive PBC uh, biopsy. Uh, they could also have another group that's the non-progressive asymptomatic. So these two groups don't have any symptoms uh, at all. Then coming to the second set of uh, uh, patients with PBC, there's one that's slowly progressive. They have symptoms, but not that, uh, going into full-blown cirrhosis very rapidly. They just dwindle al along without any problems. And then there's a subgroup that's really um, sort of uh, serious in that they have rapidly progressive disease. And in those patients, uh, they could actually go on to cirrhosis and liver failure quite quickly. So let's talk about the asymptomatic disease. It's usually a uh, majority of patients, if they're diagnosed early on, um, about 60, uh, 36 to 89% of them develop symptomatic disease after about five to 17 years. They have an elevated antimitochondrial antibody. The liver biopsy might show that. The liver test might be normal, or they might have elevated liver enzymes. One of them is the alkaline phosphatase, uh, and maybe even get jaundiced. If you have asymptomatic disease, your uh, survival is very good. 10 years, you have about 50 to 70 percent of them surviving. And then um, this was before we used ERSO. ERSO seems to have even improved this data much, much better for the asymptomatic disease uh, group. When you have symptoms, then that tells us there's something up. We need to really pay attention uh, because um, the most common symptom is fatigue, itching, pruritus, yellow eyes. They might have an enlarged liver and spleen. And they might even have pain on the right side. Uh, PBC patients, too, might have some Hyperpigmentation, they might get dark skin, so you need to look at that. They might have problems with cholesterol. We call that hyperlipidemia. And I'll show you some pictures of xanthomata when cholesterol gets deposited under the tissues around your eyes. Uh, we call thalasma or xanthomata around the tendons. You could also have uh, increased risk of other autoimmune diseases like celiac disease or thyroid disease that might be uh, symptomatic in PBC patients. And again, the dreaded complications of cirrhosis and liver failure, and we'll talk some more about that. So just to show you some escoriations, uh, because they are itching quite a bit. Um, there's a patient with uh, yellow eyes, jaundice, a very advanced uh, PBC patient. Um, cholesterol is always up in our PBC patients, and most of the patients get really upset about that. But the good news is that, although it's seen in a vast majority of patients, there's no increased risk for heart disease. It's just a marker of the disease that because of the bowel duct obstruction, your cholesterol gets elevated artificially. And so we don't re recommend lipid-lowering agents like statins, like Zocor, anything like that, unless you have a family history of coronary disease or you actually have other risk factors for coronary disease, in which case then you'll be treated. This is xanthelasma. 
You can see these lipid laden um, macrophages around the tissues. Now, that's very characteristic in some patients with PBC. You could see it in a higher power here. When it occurs on the tendons, we call them xantuma or xantumata. As you can see, these are nodules. And why do I say this? It's important sometimes that these patients with these xantumata might need transplantation, and I'll show you that in a moment. Um, these uh, nodules, if they get trapped near the nerves of your feet or hands, you might have a neuropathy, a nerve disorder, uh, dropping things, can't walk straight. And when we do a transplant, all these resolve and resolve and completely disappear. So someone who's got symptomatic neurological symptoms due to these xantumata, actually uh, liver transplantation can really help them and cure them. Um, PBC patients are at risk of osteoporosis. So you can see someone with a compression fracture of the spine. Um, you can see this spine, instead of it being nice and square, is broken because of the fragile bones that sometimes we see in PBC patients. So some of the complications we've talked about, um, bone loss, osteopenia, malabsorption, loose tools. They might have bowel salt deficiency, uh, celiac disease. They might also be deficient in some fat-soluble vitamins. These vitamins, A, D, and E, you actually need bowel to absorb these fat-soluble uh, vitamins. And if you have PBC, you don't have a lot of excretion of bowel from your bowel ducts because they're inflamed and obstructed. And we talked about high cholesterol. Um, the other complication that we'll talk about is, again, cirrhosis, veins in the esophagus that can rupture, cause internal bleeding, fluid buildup in the abdomen, confusion, peritonitis in the fluid in the abdomen, renal failure, all due to cirrhosis and liver failure, and also liver cancer. Um, again, I think you figure out that when you have these complications, we'll start thinking about transplant, and we'll talk about some more of these uh, complications going forward. This just gives you a schema of what I've already uh, discussed earlier. So again, end-state liver disease, you might have fluid buildup in your feet. We already spoke about jaundice. You might have ascites. You might have an umbilical hernia that's quite impressive, uh, all due to cirrhosis with uh, portal hypertension. These are varices. These are veins within the esophagus. They, they look like varicose veins within the esophagus that can rupture when you have cirrhosis with portal hypertension, causing internal bleeding. And uh, that's something that uh, you would want to avoid. Um, and then because the liver is cirrhotic in patients with cirrhosis, they can't really detoxify toxins that get to the liver normally from the intestines. And these toxins get shunted to the brain and you have patients with ammonia buildup, we call it encephalopathy or confusion. Again, another complication of uh, cirrhosis. And when we examine our patients with cirrhosis, you might have clues that they might be cirrhotic. They have these spider spots or spider navi, we call them. So you can see these spots. Um, you could see these in pregnant women, so don't be quick to jump to conclusion when you see a female with these spots. That's something they tell us in medical school that they have cirrhosis. It could be just uh, part of being female. Um, and again, there's an enlarged uh, picture of that liver spot. You could have redness in the palms from cirrhosis called palmary thema. Again, some people who work pneumatic drills might have <laughs> red hands just from working and not from uh, cirrhosis. They might have clubbing. These are uh, bulging digits uh, that sometimes we see in patients with cirrhosis. And men get feminized, so they have um, gynecomastia, they have enlarged breasts and the testicular atrophy. So that's something that could tell you that they might have advanced liver disease. So what about a PBC? Uh, again, I alluded to the fact that if you don't have symptoms, you do well. Asymptomatic disease, the medial survival is about 10 to 16 years. If you have symptoms, then your survival tails down a little bit to about half. If you have jaundice, one of the complications that I just showed you, your survival without transplant then drops to about two years. So having jaundice tells you that you really need to start thinking about transplant. Um, and uh, some of the asymptomatic patients might also evolve into this. So you need to be aware of that. Um, again, uh, survival is uh, a bit inferior to a healthy population. Uh, we'll talk about the surgical treatment, that's transplantation. Just a little pointer, a few points about medical. You'll be, actually be here to talk on that tomorrow. And the goal of therapy is actually to slow disease progression. You want to retard the disease so that that patient doesn't go on to cirrhosis or need a transplant down the road. And that's been quite interesting. And if you have complications, you want to treat those complications while that patient awaits uh, transplantation. You also want to improve their quality of life. I'm sure you heard about that earlier on. Um, and uh, improve the liver test, uh, uh, prevent and eliminate uh, bile duct injury, which is the hallmark of the disease, 
and improve survival free of transplant if possible. And if all else fails, then transplant will be at the back end. So we'll talk about treatment options in terms of how to treat symptoms, how to prevent uh, those symptoms from getting worse, and also specific therapy that actually uh, has had some major inroads with new drugs uh, being um, approved by the FDA today, this year. So in terms of pruritus, it's usually a big deal for our PBC patients. We tend to use antihistamines, uh, Arterax, for example, about 50% response rate. They get a bit dizzy, and, sorry, lethargic with it, so most folks don't like it. They take it at night, maybe. Cholesteramine is pretty good. It's about 90% uh, uh, response rate, and phenobab is also sometimes used, but it's very sedative, so sedated, so we, don't, we tend not to use it a whole lot. Erso uh, can be used for pruritus. I'll talk to you about some more. Um, it, it gives inconsistent results when you use it for pruritus. Refampin is quite rapid. It can cause liver injury, so your doctors will monitor your liver test if you are refamping for pruritus. And the other medications that are used, like oral uh, opiate antagonist, Zoloft, and Zofran sometimes. And again, if all else fails, you might move on to plasma freezes. And liver transplantation also cures pruritus if that has become a, a big issue for our PBC patients. How about metabolic bone disease? Uh, PBC patients are at risk. About half of patients with PBC have bone disease. Most of it is osteoporosis and osteomalacia, which is thinning of the bone mass. Usually we do a bone density scan uh, to detect that. And it's highly recommended that all PBC patients should have a scan every couple of years to really detect osteopenia or osteoporosis early on to prevent fractures down the road. And you need calcium, vitamin D, exercise, estrogen replacement if you're postmenopausal. And there are some uh, bone forming agents, alidronate and etidronate that can be used. And in liver transplantation, bone disease is very important in that patients with PBC who might have very minimal bone disease, when they get transplanted, might get progressive disease, and 50% of PBC patients might suffer fractures uh, after transplantation. Because of the steroids we gave them, it accelerates the bone loss. So we try to treat PBC patients who have bone disease very aggressively before they are transplanted, while they're waiting on the transplant list, just to help them uh, prevent this uh, major complication that can occur with transplantation. The patients with PBC might also have loose tools uh, because of not absorbing nutrients very well. Um, it could be due to decreased bowel to the intestine that helps absorption, or your pancreas might not be working very well, or you might have celiac disease, or you might have bacterial overgrowth. And uh, you would actually remedy that with a low-fat diet, medium-chain triglycerides. If you have pancreatic disease, we we'll give you some supplements. And celiac disease, you are aware of the gluten-free diet, and if you have bacterial overgrowth, we'll give you antibiotics. And we talked about the fat-soluble vitamins. Uh, vitamin A is quite common in PVC patients. About 20% of them would have that. One of the key symptoms of patients with uh, vitamin A deficiency or night blindness is that they can't see very well at night. And the traffic, not the traffic lights, the street lights look as if they have a halo around them. So if you are driving and you think you're seeing a halo around your road, uh, lights or um, traffic lights, uh, be, be careful that you might be having some night blindness and you need to uh, check that. Excessive vitamin A, on the other hand, can cause liver injury, so your doctors will check the levels, and if it's low, they'll replace it. If it's enough, they'll back off. And vitamin D is also important. It's uh, important for bone formation, as you could see. Vitamin A is important for neurological uh, uh, issues, so sometimes you might have problems with un unsteady gait, if you have a severe vitamin E deficiency, which is quite rare, so that's not usually a problem. And in vitamin K, if it's very low, you might have a, a bleeding tendency that will increase your risk of bleeding. So that usually is also quite severe for that to happen. So what about the complications? Well, so you're waiting for a transplant or you're, you have advanced liver disease from your PBC. Um, if you've had bleeding from the veins, we would actually would protect you by doing a scope first to screen for that. Um, and if you have veins, we'll give you medication called non-selective beta blockers to protect you from bleeding. Once you've bled, we'll treat the bleeding by uh, shutting down those veins with bands, or if that fails, we'll do what we call the TIPS. Patients with uh, PBC are also at risk of liver cancer, so we screen that with an, a blood test called an AFP, and then we use an ultrasound or MRI to screen for cancer um, um, every six months or so. If you have fluid buildup in your abdomen, we'll restrict your salt, give you water pills, and we could tap your belly from time to time, and we could also use tips um, 
sometimes to be a bridge to transplant. And when you have ammonia buildup, we'll give you drugs called lactulose and rifaximin. We tend not to use neomycin because that sometimes can cause kidney problems. So we try to keep away from neomycin. And so preventive care in PBC patients is important. I emphasize this because we want to protect folks while they're waiting for a transplant or even hopefully not even need a transplant. Um, so you need to avoid excessive alcohol because one plus one is 10. If you have PBC and you drink, it's a double whammy to your liver. Um, uh, if you're overweight, you have fat buildup in your liver, and that could make your cirrhosis uh, worse. So we also monitor your thyroid. We do a scope to look for those veins we call varices, and if you see those, we can protect you from bleeding. We do a bone scan, as I mentioned, and we also assess the fat-soluble vitamins every year, and we screen for celiac disease on your initial exam, and also screen for cancer with an uh, AFP, alpha fetoprotein and an ultrasound or MRI or CT, as the case might be. In terms of specific therapies, I will not dwell too much on this because I think you'll be having detailed talks on it, but just to give you a little inkling, I'm sure you all are aware of esodiol. That's the first line. And just this year, we got approved approval of uh, obiticolic acid uh, for use in patients who are intolerant of ERSO or who did not respond, in which case then you'd consider those patients having ERSO with ERSO, uh, OCAR, for esodon responders or inadequate response, that occurs in about 40% of patients on average. And again, liver transplantation, if you have cirrhosis and liver failure from PBC, that would be another specific therapy, which is not medical, but actually surgical treatment. So what about ERSO? Just a couple of words. It has to be given at an appropriate dose, 12 to 15 milligrams per kilogram per, dose, per day. It's very important because if you are underdosed, you will not get the benefit of ERSO. So that's very important. And you also want to make sure that patient responds fully to ERSO before you consider the new agent that's on the market currently. ERSO is a wonderful drug. It delays disease progression and improves your transplant-free survival. And they did a number of trials and uh, reduced the risk of death or liver transplantation over four years after being on ERSO. So that's a, a big, big deal that you need to stay on your ERSO. Um, it delays scarring and development of veins that can rupture and bleed. But if you have cirrhosis, to start off with, then we're a bit too late. You should start when you're fairly asymptomatic to really get the full benefit. So that's very important for early diagnosis and uh, prevention of uh, end-stage liver disease. Um, incomplete response, uh, rough about 40%, 30 to 66%. Normal, you fail to normalize your liver enzymes. After a few uh, months on ERSO, so your doctors will let you know that you're not responding very well, and that puts you at risk of cirrhosis because you're not responding to ERSO. So. Um, high alkaline phosphatase or GGT um, or advanced disease and you just want to make sure they're on a good dose of ERSO and that uh, some of my patients don't take their medications. Uh, my grandmother says if you want to get better you better take your meds so they need to really take their ERSO to get better and uh, I think ERSO came into the market in 87 about 30 to 40 percent of them were not responding and in 2016 we have OCAR or beta-colic acid being approved so it's been quite a while since we saw a new drug. And this, the structure for beta-colic acid is what we term an um, effect our agonist. It's multiple good things it does in terms of uh, controlling bile acid synthesis or uh, develop, uh, production and transport. The key thing is that it really is anti-inflammatory and anti